What is up, everybody? This is Ryan with the Scale Up Show. I have a very special guest on today. I have Ike Singh. Ike basically bootstrapped his way to a million ish, and then in three years catapulted that into 15 million through product led growth plus sales by only having five salespeople. Awesome, awesome journey. You got to hear this. Check it out. I'm really excited to share this to you and his journey. Check it out this episode. Welcome, everybody. This is Ryan Staley with the Scale Up Show. I have a very special guest today. I have Ike Singh. Ike is the CEO of Social 27, a virtual event platform has been helping businesses connect digitally throughout the pandemic and beyond. So they've had many phases, but experienced explosive growth, like 1,400% over the past four quarters. And on top of it, he started his professional career at Microsoft, where he focused on partner programs and marketing and went on to co-found, co-found I should say, not one, not two, but run four successful organizations, and then that led him to Social 27. Ike, happy to have you on the show, man. Welcome, welcome. Thank you so much, Ryan. It's an absolute pleasure. Looking forward to it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm excited to share your story with, uh, we chatted, uh, like I always do with my guests before, and, and get to know a little bit about them. And, you know, I, I would like you to share kind of your, your superhero origin story with everybody so they get an understanding of the, the man, the myth, the legend that is uh, basically created 1400% growth over the last four quarters. Oh, thank you, Ryan, you're too kind. Um, so I think uh, for us, I mean, firstly, yeah, so I'm Ike, uh, CEO and co-founder of Social27. Uh, you know, I used to work at Microsoft, did that for about eight years, learned a lot from there, no doubt about that thing. It was my, um, you know, extended PhD slash MBA, whatever you wanna call that. I think it was the best thing I did. But anyway, so learned a lot from there, uh, mostly marketing roles, global marketing roles and, and partner marketing events and so forth. Uh, you know, training and I mean, you know, the standard stuff you do at big corporations and trying to create an impact, you know, in a very large scale. So always had enterprise, you know, in my soul you know, when it came down to starting my own stuff was there's lots of things that could be done better and or, you know, it could be done uh, with other enterprises that Microsoft does really well could be scaled out. You know, so that was kind of what I started, you know, my uh, exit so-called from corporate life with. I was very lucky to actually have my brother with me, who's also the co-founder of Social 27. Oh, nice. And he was a developer at Microsoft, right? So imagine I'm the blah, blah, blah guy and I've got a solid developer, you know, enterprise grade guy with me, you know? Uh, so that was us, you know, we kind of started out and, uh, you know, tried a few bunch of different ideas. Uh, you know, I, all each of those companies went to over at least a million dollars in, in revenue and so forth, you know, but, um, you know, we just kept on iterating uh, over the last few years. Um, in 2019 is when there was this, you know, th- this massive quantum change that happened across the tech industry, at least from a tech services standpoint. Um, that was the first time when uh, companies like Amazon, Microsoft actually started giving away AI and machine learning services as part of their cloud suite. So we wanted to do a lot of stuff which was really cool before that. Um, you know, but just did not have the money to hire a bunch of data engineers, data science scientists to do that stuff. But once these services became more available, we started dreaming bigger, right? So that's where the, the, the new, um, my, the new social 27 was born in 2019. Um, and that is, uh, I'll, I mean, again, I can talk to you more about this story. I mean, based on whatever questions you've got. Yeah, that, that's a great background. And, and so I would love to get deeper. Quick question. I mean, what what prepared you? What do you think working at a big company or which, which part of your journey prepared you the most for founding a company and then creating explosive growth? Like what like if you had to break it down to one or two things that were just amazing, uh, had an amazing impact on your trajectory, what would you say they would be? I think the biggest things that I would say at least in the beginning of my career at Microsoft and just over the years, I would say it's the access to such amazing minds. Okay, when you work at one of these uh, really cool corporations and or big companies out there, I mean, the people who are there, they're from all over the world and in most cases, they're the best of the best, right? So the just being with them and learning from them, some of my managers during that time and or even my peers, you know, really helped me understand, uh, you know, from their experience, but then having a global role in which I would, you know, work with, I mean, I don't know, all across the world, Asia, Europe, you know, Africa and so forth, South America, 
you know, I really also got a very good understanding of how do you take, you know, your, um, you know, strategies and you globalize them, you know, and what are the nuances, you know, while that happens, you know, so I think it was an amazing experience in learning from the best, but also being able to then execute um, on a global basis and yeah, mess up sometimes and understand why, you know, because you always think like, oh, this worked really well here, why doesn't it work there? You know, so it's just, just, Knowing those things, I think, was what prepared me really well to think, um, I guess, from the bottom up, uh, you know, keeping global in mind and keeping scale in mind. I think global and the scale of things to be able to execute on scale and what does that take, I think, was certainly some of the things I learned there. I love that. I could see that. I mean, there is a lot of really sharp people at big companies. And I know because, like, I ran a VP of strategic, I was a VP of strategic accounts and ran a team where we would just sell the Fortune 1000, Fortune 500. There you go. And I actually yeah. love the people that I got to meet as a result of that because they just thought differently uh, than the people I was around. So, d- d- you know, I'm sure everybody's thinking, you know, did you get a little quality time with Bill at all or, or Steve Ball or any of those guys? Any of the big <laughs> names? The big well, boys? you know, I'll be honest. So, okay. Um, I, I mean, I'm still a big fan of Bill and I was certainly a very, very big fan of Bill when I got into, so, uh, you know, into Microsoft. And uh, the best thing about him was that, you know, because again, I used to do a lot of event stuff, right? So, you know, if we were at an industry event and he was keynoting at a lot of these big events, so he would actually stop by sometimes, you know, at the Microsoft booth or whatever, you know, and get an opportunity to like shake hands and have a quick, hi, don't worry, we got, we got this kind of thing. And it was always, a, I mean, it happened like maybe twice in my life, but the point is, um, it was amazing. Um, my team right now is at COP26, which is the global climate change conference that is going on. And just in the morning today, I was talking to my VP of BizDev. And again, you know, we are helping them with a lot of things when it comes to that conference. But the bottom line is that I was just talking to him and Bill Gates passed by because he's speaking there. <laughs> and, you know, so two minutes after that, they, you know, uh, was Joe Biden, uh, the president, and, and then other people. So it's just amazing as to when you are doing, you know, in, in, the, in this industry that you really, I mean, now we don't get to sit down with them and have a, a, a glass of, you know, whatever. But the point is that, you know, just being around them and seeing that energy, it's pretty amazing. Yeah. I love that, man. Yeah, it, it's uh, it's cool. You get a little starstruck sometimes, uh, <laughs> but it's it's impressive, you know. So uh, did you like, so, so let's give everybody a quick rundown of your company so they have a little context to where, yeah. where some of this is going. So roughly what year did you start, start the business? Uh-huh. So 2007 was when we incorporated the company. That's the social 27 to think one of the reasons is that. Um, but again, that was when the incorporation happened. You know, we, 2008 was when the world fell off the cliff. We were planning on getting something into the yeah. market at that time. Nothing happened. Uh, me and my brother basically spend a lot of time consulting, you know, keeping the fires burning and coming up with all sorts of ideas on the side and making those happen. Uh, so, yeah, it's been a while from a from a incorporation standpoint. Uh, but I mean, in reality, the company has been under the label uh, Social 27, but we've had many other brands that we built underneath it, which were some of the mm-hmm. companies, you know, that you can see on my LinkedIn and so forth. Uh, you know, so but Social 27 became again completely Social 27 uh, with our virtual events platform, I would say more like 2018 onwards. Yeah. Okay, gotcha. So, th- so that's really like if you include multiple pivots and and things like that, it's probably more the starting point. And so, you know, w- what revenue number were you at at that point? Ballpark. Um, we were making less than a million dollars. Uh, again, this was all. So, so the way I, the way we thought about our business was, look, I mean, we've got a lot of experience. Myself, you know, my brother as well as some of the other people, the core team. So we would, if we are focused on a certain area uh, that we want to grow our, build a product in, you know, the the best way to do that is to actually not just sit in a garage and just, you know, kind of like sit in your own bubble and figure it out. It's being out there, you know? So for us, while we were building our stuff, we were consulting on a lot of stuff that was very close to what our product was going to be. So building those relationships out there, working, you know, with those teams, you know, at our customers and understanding their pain points and seeing how this product could solve them. So 2018 was a year when we actually stopped doing a bunch of other stuff that we were doing, you know, uh, which could have become businesses of their own. But then, you know, it was more like, no, guys, let's focus on this whole AI machine learning game, recommendation Mm -hmm. engines, prediction engines, all that fun stuff for events. 
Okay, and for that particular purpose, let's make sure that we are aligned with, uh, you know, consulting gigs that are focused on taking events into the next world and or video, you know, encoding streaming and or, you know, how to build, you know, uh, rapidly, uh, you know, some kind of a machine learning that can, you know, a bot or whatever, you know, so it's like, let's get into this game and do everything that we do um, in alignment with what our product vision is as much as closely as possible. Right, so that we are continuing to keep our one foot in the real world and one foot in our product development world, and and don't miss out on the, the pulse of the market. Okay, that's I mean that's that's great detail, and I'm, you, you'll follow me where I'm going here. So you started in 2007. You were kind of figuring things out, doing consulting. Was that did did you ever have significantly higher revenue than that million dollar mark? Uh, yeah, we cost? were yeah we were sitting at around about three million or so. You know, um, I would say in 2011, 2012 range. Um, you know, but again, the you know how consulting gigs are. I mean, you know, they'll suck you in with the money. But the point is, you know, it's still a service business. You know, it can never really. Again, I'm not saying that they don't go anywhere, but it wasn't what my right. dream was. We wanted to build product, so. We were self-funding ourselves, you know, at that stage. So whatever money we used to make, we used to put into our product, you know, and that's when we kind of launched the first version of our virtual events platform was 2012-ish. Uh, you know, we'd had good success with it. You know, we were again sitting on those two, three million, four million dollar marks, uh, you know, for our, uh, you know, annual revenue at that stage. Uh, but yeah, so that's kind of how it was. Okay. And and so then you, you kind of dropped back down. You focused a little bit prim primarily in, you know, 2017, 2018, right? And then, and then where are you at now? Because I want people to pace because there's, there's, there's a lot of founders that are bootstrapped, right? Or in the middle of bootstrapping right now or looking at taking on funding. And so, you know, I know we talked and you said, mentioned there's a small upfront investment or some small investment you have, but it's primarily self-funded, which I absolutely love. Mm -hmm. And then talk about just the explosive growth you've had from that point to now, like where you're at revenue wise, because I think it's yeah. an amazing story. Certainly, Ryan. So yeah, 2018, we actually were like, look, we, we are very, very close to, I'm talking about later 2018, like we had right. a very clear vision of what we wanted to build, right? So again, we wanted, what are events? Events is equal to content consumption and networking. So we looked at what do people enjoy when it comes to content consumption in their normal lives? They enjoy Spotify, they enjoy YouTube, they enjoy Netflix. And mm -hmm. what do they enjoy when it comes to networking online? LinkedIn. So like we learned from all of these experiences, what's the one thread that binds it all together? It's, hey system, give me the whole universe, but don't let me have to search for it. Understand what I'm looking for and give me recommendations and make them better every day. Okay, great. How can you do that? It requires AI, ML, recommendation engines. And then on the other side, okay, everybody's just really sick and tired of like, you know, the, the spray and pray, uh, you know, world of, you know, networking. So how do I help them? You know, so how can I create the best matches between buyers and sellers? You know, so that's a prediction engine. So the recommendation and prediction engine is the same, uh, two sides of the same coin. You know, the more recommendations I give you, I get to know more about you. And the more I can predict what you're going to buy or not going to buy. So I kind of get the right people together. So very simple in terms of what the philosophy was. And we very clearly knew that. So 2019 was the year when we pretty much just hunkered down and we built, built, built. Um, and early 2020 is when we came into market. So 2018, less than a million revenue. 2019, same way. No, close to a million, you know, but we're still doing some some gigs and stuff here and there. But early 2020 is when we started uh, seriously, like talking to our customers and showing them our new product. Um, and then in uh, Q2 of 2021, sorry, 2020 is when things picked up. Massive, massive incoming, uh, you know, because of COVID. Um, and again, we were ready. Our boat was ready. Uh, you know, the whole Shakespeare thing I talked to you about, you know, around like, you know, uh, you know, tides come in once in a while in the affairs of men. So yeah, the tide came for us, you know, and uh, as they say, like overnight, su overnight success takes about eight years. So we were ready with the product at that point in time, which was exactly what the market needed because we had put like what three last two or three years deeply understanding what the customers want. The yes, COVID expedited the adoption of the product, but believe me, it would have taken another couple of years and we would have probably still been where we were. It's not something, it was a new need that was unearthed. It was a need that would have come anyways, we just, all of us came to it faster. You know, so that's kind of what happened. And so that took us from, you know, I mean, literally, as I said, less than a million dollars in revenue in 2018, 2019 to 2020, ended up with about 6 million in revenue, which is 
Um, we did more in sales, but revenue in a SaaS company is what you can recognize is, you know, what you delivered right. and blah, blah, blah. So, uh, yeah, we did a lot more in sales than that, but we had about roughly six million, five and a half to six million dollars in revenue. Uh, and then, you know, we kept on going. Um, I'll be honest, it was a lot of our customers in 2019, you know, uh, sorry, 2020 were the customers who might not have been our ideal customer profile mm. because it was a like an emergency in the universe, right? So like everybody and anyone was like, hey, come on, help me. So we did a lot of things which were one-offs and were not annual agreements, not the traditional SaaS stuff, you know, but we were just like, hey man, we gotta help these people and hopefully a lot of these people will become our long-term customers. We did a massive churn at the end of the year, uh, lost 30, 40% of the clients because as I said earlier, they were not the best fit. Losing 30, 40% of your client base isn't the best I, you know, feeling in the universe. Yeah. You know, but again, in the beginning, it hurt a little bit, but then just over the last few months after that, we felt better about it because we were able to better serve the ideal customer who we made this for. So we are much focused on the upper mid market and the enterprise, um, and they are able to get the best use out of what we have made. And so that is then, you know, so that ended that year. Then we really kind of focused on our ideal customer and, and taking care of their needs. And hopefully, I mean, at this stage, we, until about Q3 into this year, you know, we are, I think we'll end this year with 14-ish, close to 15. Uh, in, in Love year. it, man. Yeah. Yeah. Love your persistence over time with that. So so let's let's talk about that. And I know you, you, you uh, it sounds like you put in a lot of hard work. You said deeply understanding the customer. How did, how did you get to the point or, or what was the mechanism? And I know it, it got accelerated because of the pandemic, but w- what would you say is the, w- what's your, how do you scale revenue that fast? What did you do? How did you do it? What did the team look like? Walk us through some of that because I'm sure people are like, "Hey, getting under the under the hood here." I'd love to hear how that how that's possible and how you make that massive jump in such a short period of time. Sure, Ryan, that's a very very good question. So I get, I mean, I get asked that question many times. So we went from a less than about like 20-ish, 20 ish, twenty twenty five people company to about mm-hmm. two hundred and thirty people in a matter of wow. four months. Okay, so wow. the point is that was a quite a gigantic step in itself because, I mean, if I'm serving the enterprise, they need to talk to people, you know I mean? They have specific needs and so forth. I mean, I can't just be like, hey man, just talk to my email bot, right? So the point is um, we had to grow exponentially from people perspective. And a lot of this again was dev team plus, you know, um, operations people, account managers, customer success managers, you know, because that's standard in a software business right now. You have to have a CSM. I mean, nobody's gonna give you work otherwise. You know, so a lot of those kind of, uh, you know, people, um, I was lucky enough that my core team, my 20 ish people had been with us for a really long time and they really understood our vision and were the ones, you know, who, I mean, were really just up to the, uh, to the challenge. I mean, it was a very challenging year to grow so much so fast, uh, and to all put all those new processes in place and all that. And I was very lucky to also hire lots of amazing people. Um, if I had to do all of this in a normal world and had to hire a bunch of these people, 200 plus new people in Seattle in a quarter, impossible, no way, and very, very expensive. But because of the whole remote work situation, I hired across the world. Okay, so I have people now working for Social 27 in 10 plus countries in the world and about, I don't know, 15, 20 states across the US. It doesn't matter where you are, you know, if you are the right kind of person, you know, we, we want to work with you. Right, so that is, I think, what really helped us to grow really, really fast. And because we knew our business so well, um, and it's not something that we were like building this, you know, while we were flying it. You know, yeah, I'm not gonna say yes, we did build some things like that because the, there was a need in the customer's mind. But we were pretty ready. So imagine that that ship I was talking about earlier, right? The tide came and we'd set, we we were that 25 person crew. We picked up some awesome crew on the way uh, in those islands, um, you know, while we were on our journey and, you know, we picked up some treasures as we went by. And, you know, I think we uh, I think we've certainly hit promised land a couple of times <laughs> in our journey so far. So, yeah, that's kind of the story there. Yeah. So so to, to dig a level deeper, like how did you what's your so what's your customer acquisition motion like with marketing and sales like? Uh-huh. Do you have a lot of inbound? Do you have an outbound strategy? Um, what's what's the sales process look like in terms yeah. of length? Just walk us through that a little bit. Sure. So um, one more thing 
the reason why I really went for this this market, the events market, or any any of these you know sales and marketing um, automation worlds, uh, you know, is all of my customers. So for example, if I get you Ryan as a customer, right? Right. You're in the B2B world. So I focus on B2B. So now what happens is when you use my software, you in, invite all your B2B customers to it. So they get to see my software because you invited mm -hmm. them, right? So it's like, oh, they're like, what is this thing, Ryan? I like what you are doing out here. Who are these people? So my sales team has never exceeded five or six people, okay? And I, me and my VP of biz dev, who's been with us for a million years, you know, we were selling together for the first like six plus months. I was on every call, right? So again, there was two reasons for it. You know, one was I really wanted to understand what the customer wants because there's no better way. And we were, the good thing was that everything was happening online, right? Zoom and Microsoft Teams. So we could record every call and nobody had a problem with that. And so just having that intelligence of every call and hundreds and hundreds of demos really helped us to very, very like pinpoint what are the customer's needs? What do we need to say? What not to say? Okay, it's, this was like ongoing training happening. New person joins the team. Here's like six calls you gotta listen to. And these all happened last week. And get on 10 more calls right now because they're all gonna get recorded, right? So the point is just this, this, this new way of doing things really help us expedite and pinpoint the customer's pain points and come up with the right solutions for those pain points, right? So that helped us. Um, beyond that, I would say, again, the product-led growth was our sales motion. You know, again, I there wasn't a month I spent more than, I don't know, 15,000 on marketing, okay, in all of these years, you know, like at least in the last year and a half, I mean, we did lots of revenue, but I'm not saying I should not have, maybe I should have, you know, but the point is that I wanted to really understand my business better, okay? Uh, there's a lot of companies in my space which have grown exponentially. They've taken a lot of money. Uh, you know, for me, it's like, it's it's the long race that I'm in here for, okay? And the long race is equal to really, really understanding your customer and as the customer is evolving and just focusing on them as the target and their needs as the target versus what my competition is doing or not, right? So that's, that's our focus. And uh, this is an amazing business to be in. All my customers come to my events and they reach out to us and we're able to give them what they want. That's great. I love that. So... Predominantly product-led growth, five, six salespeople, which is not, not very many for that, that revenue number. Um, are you doing outbound then to start the initial conversation? Is that kind of what, what we are doing from? outbound? We do get a lot of inbound, as I said, right? Because people come to our virtual events and they see it and they like what they see and they, you know, I mean, they reach out, you know, so that's what also keeps us on our toes to make sure our, our experiences are great because uh, if I have a bad experience, I'm not losing one customer. I'm losing all the people who came to the party. Oh, yeah. right? So, I mean, it's, uh, yeah, it's a double-edged sword. So the point is, um, but, you know, we've been lucky. My product team is awesome. You know, so, yeah, I'm not going to say that we haven't lost customers. We have, uh, you know, but overall, no, we are, we are doing really well. Um, you know, so I think, yes, product-led growth has been our focus area. Uh, outbound, yes, we still do outbound. There's a lot of noise in our market right now. I mean, everybody and, and their Cat has a virtual event platform in today's world. You know, so the thing is, you know, we are doing a really good job at serving our current customer. We get a lot of referrals from that. But then also, yes, we do certainly reach out. Um, there is a motion, but again, as I said, I don't spend more than 10, 15K a month on that. Yeah. Okay, that's awesome. Uh, did you do anything to systemize referrals as well? Uh, Zoom info, we use Zoom info, you know, just to kind of get a better understanding, you know, of what is going on because we have a strategy of land and expand. You know, so again, when you focus on the upper mid market and the enterprise, you know, you have to somehow get past, you know, that the, the you know, the castle walls, you know, which are guarded by procurements, you know, barriers, you know, but once you, you know, you appease them and you, you know, you, you're able to take care of some of that stuff, then you're in. Once you're in, you have the massive opportunity because, I mean, the first project that you get mostly with the big enterprises is, is like a small little sliver in that ocean mm -hmm. that they have, right? So... If you can do a good job of presenting yourself and give them really good value, you can really expand. I mean, I'll give you small examples. You know, I mean, I, I cannot name names. I mean, I don't know if they, my customers will let me do that, but essentially I have so many accounts which started at like 70K, you know, uh, for the first agreement that they did with us. And within a year have expanded to 1.5 million. And the, one of those accounts is upwards of 2 million at this stage, right? It's just within less than a year. Right, so there's multiple teams who've done agreements with us now, multiple subsidiaries globally who are doing agreements with us now because they like what they see. 
right? So I think uh, treat each of these big corporations as a small business in itself. That's the first thing. Like, don't just only think about them as like, okay, you know, I've got this massive goose. I'm going to kill it today and get all those eggs, right? It's not going to happen that way. You know, a goose will lay one egg a day, one gold egg a day, and that's, you got to wait for it. You know, so it's just, but you got to love that goose and you got to take care of it, you know, and, and, and just kind of go, you know, be patient. Yeah. Yeah. I, I lived and breathed in the enterprise space for like seven years. And yeah, there was, um, I think if you look at it when we started, I think our average sale size was closer to like maybe 40K to 70K. And then by the end, it was like, it's like 400K to you know, 7 million. <laughs> yeah, there you go. So, yeah. yeah. I mean, you could keep growing in those mm-hmm. accounts if, if you do a great job. And I love the the virality of your product. So that's pretty cool. Um, what would you say is like, you know, if you had to look at it, like that's a long time that it took you to get to this point of the explosive growth. Like, what did you have to believe internally yourself to, to get past that point and keep that persistence of, Kind of that you, I wouldn't say you plateaued because it sounded like you started to grow, but you were just growing kind of incrementally before you had that big exponential jump. So, what did you, as a founder, would you have to believe to really truly get past that and get past the inner voice of saying I should be going faster or we should be further along by now? Yeah, no, no, that happens every day. I mean, I don't know any entrepreneur in the world who hasn't gone through these ups and downs. Okay, and that is what makes you, you know, so. Uh, again, me and my brother, who is the co-founder, we always did have a dream of having a company which will have a worldwide impact, right? So, I mean, like, I think we are there right now. Um, but anything that we were doing over the years wasn't like we were not enjoying it, right? So the point was we were always doing things that we were really enjoying. Um, and yes, I agree. In some of those markets, we were early. Even with the virtual events, we started like in 2012 and streaming was so expensive that we were, people were like, man, I really want to do more with you, but I can't. It's too expensive. You know, so the point was we were, we are just, I think, a little too visionary uh, when it comes to our minds, you know, and and that was a problem, you know. So I think in many markets that we got into, we kind of ran out of gas before anything could happen, you know. And and so we were a little too early and we were like, oh, everything's, everything's just going to super change overnight and it would day not, you know. So this time around, the universe listened and it was there at the same time when we were ready for it, right? So, but we were always having a great time doing what we were doing. So I think, and still making money, because again, that's the thing, the love, the lovely part about B2B is that you don't lift a finger unless you have a PO, right? So we were still having a great time, you know, building amazing product on the side, but still working with amazing companies, consulting with them about similar things that we love doing anyways, and taking those learnings back into the product. The product would take longer, you know, because I wasn't doing it all day, every day, you know, because we were still like trying to pay the bills, you know, but that was fine because it made us all grow into who we are. You know, so keep on doing what you enjoy doing, you know what? And one day you'll strike gold, okay, hopefully, you know, that's all it is. Love yeah. it. I love that, man. That's, that's great to hear you say that because there's a lot of folks that I talk to that are, they're struggling or they're, you know, year seven into their nine year overnight success. Right. <laughs> so, uh, so it's good. It's good to hear that. So we're just about up on time. So where can people find you? Where can they learn more about you and Social27? Yeah, I would say, I mean, LinkedIn is the best place, you know, uh, Social27, we are on LinkedIn. I mean, I'm there on LinkedIn. I think it's the best place. Reach out to us, you know, if you have any questions and or anybody wants to talk more about some of the stuff we talked about today, Ryan, more than happy to do that as well. Excellent. Well, Ike, it was great getting a chance to sit down with you. Loved hearing your story and really, really happy that, you're, you're having the success that you are and, you know, things are kind of taking it to the next level. Not kind of, they are taking it to the next level for you and your brother. So awesome, awesome story. It's inspiration to a lot of people. So thanks for being on the show today. Thank you so much, Ryan. My pleasure. It was, and thank you. I think uh, I like your train of thought. I love your other episodes that you guys do. So I think it's a great service. I mean, I've heard you guys and got inspired many times. So yeah, thank you for having awesome. me. Awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. That means the world. 